From the John DeVita Broadcast Center, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another broadcast of Armchair Experts with Jim Leon and Rich Massaro on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network and Jack FM 89.7 WRHS FM Norwich on Wednesday, March the 4th, the year of our Lord, 2015. And now, here they are, live and in person, Jim and Rich. <laughs> I don't know about how live we are, but we're certainly in person. Thank you, John DeVito. Off and running. Once again on another edition of Armchair Experts. We've got so many things we could talk about. I don't know where to begin today. I was going to say, I, I see that you have the uh, sports page turned to did the Hawks end up. I know they were up three zip. 5-2. 5-2. 5-2. Uh, everybody played well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't look completely at the, uh, at the stats uh, last night after the game, but uh, uh, Vermette played. I think, you know, people were question. I think you and I were questioning how many centers do they need. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when I was, uh, after you and, after I left you uh, last night, I stopped over at, uh, uh, I was going to stop and pick up something at uh, Mariano's and changed my mind, drove through the parking lot, had the radio on, and I had the score on, and somebody was on talking about this. And, and they, they brought up a good point. The acquisition of Vermette, really, even though he's a center, and that makes, what, five centers? Actually, uh, six, I think. I can't even remember. But th- he kind of stressed the idea. He says, this really gives them a lot of flexibility now because you could put Vermette on the first line, mm-hmm. and you could, have, you could get times during a game where you can have uh, – uh, Taze centering the second and third, you know, uh, centering another line and be out there against the opposition's second and third line. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, uh, you know what I was going to say, Jim. I I also heard uh, on my way from the library home, which is a real short ride, but yeah. uh, I listened to a little bit of the game and uh, it was interesting. The comments that I picked up in the short time I was in the car, it sounded to me like that when uh, Desjardins. Uh, gets there, that Tavo Teravainen might be the odd man out. That, that's possible. And uh, so that would fit Desjardins, I guess, possibly in between Bickle and Shaw. Yeah. And I'm thinking now, is Brad Richards the odd man out as well? Because uh, I, obviously I, Taves is going to center the first line, and uh, Vermette is in between, um, uh, who would it be, Saad and Sharp. Yeah. And I know Saad scored last night. Yeah, uh, I don't know if uh, Vermette got an assist on that or not. But I'm thinking, is Richards uh, the guy who's I, gonna uh, get less ice time? I'm not sure. That that'll be interesting to see. And uh, uh, then the, they're starting to talk about who is uh, Timonen uh, Timonen gonna be paired up with. Well, it was last night. I thought uh, it was gonna be Seabrook. But I'm sure that when uh, Oduya comes back, that'll probably change. That's what that's what a lot of people thought. Uh, that he's going to wind up um, um, being paired up with somebody else. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they say, here's a guy who re- really hasn't played this year but is is healthy now, mm-hmm. and he's going on 40. But right. they said, he's still a, he's still a player. He may not he may not be able to get you get the puck out of the zone in a penalty kill situation by himself, but he sure knows how to move it up and get it out of the way. Well, Jim, I was interested uh, in uh, one of the things about this whole Hawks uh, situation because you and I had been hot and heavy uh, in terms of uh, going back and forth on the uh, texting over the weekend because I had heard the rumor that uh, they were going to try to trade Sharp to the Capitals and there were two or three other players coming supposedly uh, maybe coming our way. And then uh, as the Monday deadline came closer, I started to think to myself, it's really not the way the Hawks uh, operate. They they don't like they, you know they they might plug in, say let's say this Desjardins. I don't know for sure, but maybe Desjardins will take Ben Smith's place on the uh, penalty kill. Yeah. So it's a natural. It's a yeah. one for one. Yeah. T- uh, Timonen is going to, uh, uh, you know, take a place that maybe they feel hasn't been filled adequately by other defensemen. Uh, once Oduya comes back. Team and will be one of the six, 
uh, and he'll be teamed with either Roosevelt or Lund Lundblad or they'll, what, however they're going to do it, but he'll be naturally plugged in. And Vermette, obviously, is being plugged in to replace Kane. So it's all nice and neat. But when, if you start to throw, say, uh, three more players into the mix, that becomes a little bit too complicated, and it doesn't really make as much sense as I thought it did at first. And it doesn't fit what the Hawks have done in previous uh, years as far as uh, trading right before the deadline. Mm -hmm. So, that my, But the thing that I'm uh, asking myself is... Uh, They've traded away some younger defensemen, and I'm trying to think who the heck is left at uh, at Rockford. And I, I was, was going to take a look before I yeah, came. I didn't look at the Rockford uh, roster, so but I don't didn't know. You, did you tell me, though, uh, when they traded Clen Denning, they traded him for a young, like an 18-year-old yeah. defenseman, right? Yeah, yeah. He, he went for a young, a young defenseman. I can't think of his name. Yeah, I don't remember his name either. I don't remember his name. But I know Stephen... We need to do our homework Steve, more before Steven, we start some Steven of this. Stephen Johns is still down at Rockford. Yeah. He's a yeah. big stay-at-home defenseman. And yeah. it seems to me, I guess maybe if you're a hockey fan and you you know more about it than, say, I do, uh, they, they're they looking for two types of defensemen. One is a, uh, a guy who moves the, the puck out of the uh, the zone. The other is a you know a stay at home type of guy. Yeah, I, I, maybe the maybe that's the only two type of defensemen there are. I don't know, but that, that's I, I, you know. yeah, you you know what I mean. I I look at it and I think you're right. I think the the the, the Blackhawk defensemen are 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 basically you know two types: the 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 mobile kind that can move around, get in the way, and the guys that are the bangers. Right. You know. Right. It, it it was interesting though. I really have to, I, you know, you have to think about this. Getting, um, um, you know, what they gave up over the weekend. You know, at least what they gave up over the weekend with or with all these deals. They gave up Smith. They gave up a prospect, Klaus uh, Dahlbeck, and right. four draft picks over the next three years. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? I mean, some of those. You can expect them to get, you you can expect them to get them back when they start making sal some salary cap moves after the season's over. Yeah. yeah. So I again, this is uh, uh, I, I look at this, and even though we may question the the, the player mix, uh, the mechanics of the deal, uh, uh, Scott Bowman was very uh, uh, Jim Hendry like in getting something for not that much. I, you know, I, I have to say, I was thinking about this the other day. I, I think that the Hawks uh, management people, you know, the people who make these decisions, are about as sharp a group as we've seen in Chicago. Oh, yeah. In, in the time that I've yeah. been following sports in this town. Yeah. Uh, they're very, you know, and, you know, uh, put it this way. I had no idea who uh, Timonen was. I remembered him. Uh, from, I remembered from him the from, Stanley from, Cup, from the Stanley uh, Cup, ago. and it was one of those things. I remembered him from the Stanley Cup, and it was when I heard the name. I'm going, "Wow, he's still playing." <laughs> but they seem, they, I mean, they seem to know, uh, you know, have a good feel for who will fit in uh, well on their team. Yeah, you know, when they when they got Michael Hans, uh, yeah, when they got Hans Hanzus, Hanzus. Yeah. Uh, you know, he had been sitting and and been a healthy scratch with the Sharks for a number of games prior to them getting him. But he came in and, and did a really uh, nice job for them. Yeah. So uh, you know, for a couple of years. And you know what I mean? It's it's maybe it's just the nature na nature of the game and the way things are, or the fact that uh, is everything really pretty competitive. I cannot remember a hockey dead trade deadline where there were so many deals made. Yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah. There's there. They were. Uh, you know. There was a uh, the Rangers. Uh, I could even recognize this made a big one. They got a very good defenseman in Keith Yandel. Yes, and, from uh, uh, Arizona. From correct? Arizona, yeah. yeah. So that, it makes you wonder, though, where is Arizona going? Because uh, well, they, they've give, they've given up a few, a couple of their pretty good players. Here. They are they are selling out for draft picks and trying to get themselves in position for the first uh, uh, for the first pick in the draft right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now, I think it's still based on points, correct? Right now, they're third in the draft. They would be the third pick in the draft. Okay. Behind Buffalo and Edmonton. Okay. Well, Buffalo is uh, not doing that well. Buffalo is 19, 39, and 5, 43 Almost. points. Man. 
Edmonton okay. is eighteen thirty five and ten, and Arizona is twenty thirty six and seven. Okay. So that you know what, with them trading a couple of their better players, they could possibly fall into the first spot. If yeah. you want to put it that way. Yeah, fall I mean in, they're I they're in right. they're in a sell off and uh, they're in a sell off mode and in re and in a rebuild mode. I think uh, whoever owns the team now is is committed to putting a good product on the ice and starting to draw trying to draw people back because they have not uh, they've never been a big draw down there. Yeah, were, uh, were, was that the uh, first incarnation of the Winnipeg Jets? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, okay. This, that was uh, the original. That was the original uh, uh, Winnipeg Jets. Okay. Well, you know, it's interesting, and I, I, I don't, I don't want to really get off on this subject that much. But when you look at the NHL these days, and you look at where some of the uh, teams are, you wonder how those decisions were made to get into those markets, because they're not what you would really think of as hockey markets. No, and but you know what? I think the idea was, well, you got a lot of retirees that have moved down there. There are people that came from the snow belt. They were hockey fans. By golly, they'll be hockey fans down here. And, you know, I don't know. I, I guess maybe you just don't think of it. Um, I mean, you know, you got, what, two teams in Florida. Yeah, two teams in Florida. You got a team in Nashville. Yeah. You got, you got a, team. a team in Dallas. You got a team in Carolina. Carolina. Although I think some of those situations. Carolina has won a Stanley Cup. Yeah. And uh, so has uh, uh, Tampa, I Tampa, thought. I think Tampa, Tampa won a Stanley Cup. Yeah, Tampa has. Uh, although, let's see, I, I'm trying to think. And I think Nashville actually has a pretty good uh, fan base. Nashville has, a, Nashville has a very strong fan base. They've got a great arena. Mm-hmm. It were right in downtown Nashville. Mm-hmm. Um, when we were there a, a couple of years ago uh, and wandering around n- n- downtown Nashville in an afternoon, um, we walked. We walked in. They uh, the Predators have a nice gift shop set up that's open all the time in the lobby. Uh-huh. Beautiful arena right in downtown Nashville. Yeah. Well, and I, I love I love Nashville anyhow. So you know, li- life is not the Grand Old Opry. Yeah, even though even though the old Ryman is a couple of blocks away from there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, uh, uh, all in all, though, and I also think, great uh, mu- also great music up and down the street that the arena's in. I was going to say though to get back to uh, maybe where, where we started. I, I would say overall, though, it looks like the Hawks uh, strengthen themselves, and that should be interesting going forward. I, I it, it's uh, I, I still. Have to maybe watch a whole game to get a sense of uh, who who was in and who was out, and uh, as far as uh, how know, the, yeah, it's going to be who they're going to play. Yeah, it's going to be interesting on how the pairings are going to be. Yeah, um, you know, again, it's like so here's uh, Mark Lazarus's column. So let's see. I guess they were talking about the Kings. I guess he's saying the Kings were very strong in the uh, uh, in the middle last year with their centers Mm -hmm. and it's kind of wondering if the blackhawks are starting to emulate them uh but it's no exaggeration to say the hawks are significantly better down the middle than they were a year ago and comparable to the 2014 kings the hawks opened last season playoffs with jonathan taze michael hanzus andrew shaw and kruger at center this year they're likely to open with taze antoine vermet brad richards kruger with hanzus in europe shaw back at his natural spot as a winger and Tevo Teravainen waiting for an op- waiting for an opportunity. Well, let me ask you this: the, He doesn't mention Desjardins. Is he is a, he a center or is he a, a wing? Or I, doesn't it matter? I, I don't doesn't know. I, I don't know if it, it matters. Uh, I thought Desjardins was a center. Okay. I, I thought know. I looked it up and I saw him as a center because I had to rem- Yeah, center. Okay. Adding feisty center Andrew Desjardins from San Jose in exchange for the struggling Ben Smith. Two hours before Monday's deadline gave Coach Joel Quenville even more options while freeing up more than $1 million of cap space moving forward. There's the key right there. Yeah. Well, what you know what? What the heck happened to uh, Ben Smith? I mean, he really, he, Boy, when they say struggled, he did struggle. He, I mean, I don't even follow the team that close, but it was pretty apparent that he was struggling. No points in 25 games and was a healthy scratch twice in the last three weeks. 
Yeah, I mean, you know what, which is really sort of a compliment to Ben Smith, the type of guy he is, because when you score no points in 25 games and you're still only a healthy scratch twice, you must be doing something still right. But that, I mean, they're looking for somebody who's actually going to put the uh, the puck in the net once in a put, while. Put the biscuit put in the, the basket, biscuit in, in the, the basket, basket, as they say. And maybe Desjardins, I mean, he... He, he's not going to have to put it in all that much to surpass what Ben was doing. So no, no. I, you know, you when you and I were talking the other day, though, one of the reasons I thought that they st- that they might do a big trade, even though it doesn't fit their mo, is that so many guys have struggled. I mean, Shaw hasn't had the year that he had last year. Bickle, I don't think. Uh, I mean, considering his well, that's that's an interesting one because. You know he's making if you if the papers are right he's making four million which is a good salary. Bickle, but I mean, yeah, but he's yeah. he's also on that, the third line, so I yeah. don't know how much production you actually it, uh, expect from a third line winger, it, uh, even though you're paying him four mil. Uh, uh, Sharp has struggled. Uh, you know, Oduya has struggled. Sharp has been non-existent really yeah. this year. Um, and, and Bickle, you you can't pay somebody four million and and just wait for them to come alive during the playoffs, which seems to be. I his, agree with that. Which yeah. has been his which has been his uh, uh, career. It seems like he made his money uh, a couple of years ago when he had a big playoff series, and that's how he got the big contract. Mm-hmm. You have to start to wonder now. Okay, you know, I think they're in. A, I think they're in a position to go deep into the playoffs. Uh, I don't know if you're going to be talking about a Stanley Cup team. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know you're going to have to start to wonder who's going to be dealt in the off season, especially when they start looking at salary cap issues. And you got to think sharp. Yeah. Well, and I, I can't remember if he's in this last year or not. I that I don't know. But well, uh, that that was another thing, Jim. Why I was so hot on on that trade maybe being a possibility is you know what they could shed that salary now. And I was thinking maybe, you know, that Bickle might even uh, be included because then you, you shed those two salaries and you get maybe a couple guys that you want in return and, and maybe you even keep one, one of those guys. I, I wouldn't be surprised that at some point in time uh, you see Joel Ward, who was one of the guys that was being named uh, as a possible guy coming back this way if Sharp was traded, I wouldn't be surprised if you see him eventually become a Blackhawk somewhere down the road. Because when I, I look at Joel Ward, I sort of think about a guy that I don't think we've ever adequate, re, adequately uh, replaced in, uh, in Buffalo, Justin Buffalo. No, 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 we never. And uh, I think that Joel Ward, uh, you know, I think they would want, I think they want that from Bickle, but I, I don't know if that's really is Bickle's uh, personality, if you want to put it that way. But I think you, you, you may, when I look at Joel Ward, you might get that type of play from a guy like Joel Ward. Mm-hmm. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if somewhere down the road you see him become a Blackhawk. Uh, but at any rate, that's all speculation. But uh, I, I just thought maybe that they would figure they're not really going the way they want to go. This could be an opportunity to dump some of that salary right now, even though you're going to rent uh, two or three players. So what? Uh, you know, you're still going to. So what? You're still going to have to dump that salary. You might as well get something for them now, and maybe hope it helps you yeah. this year. Yeah. So you know, you play. And you know, if you're in a position to make a run at it, you got to play for now. Right. You know, if, as as opposed to when you look at somebody as we were talking about Arizona, who's just dumping to get themselves in position for a good draft a good draft pick and start to rebuild. Well, I, I don't always buy into this when you read in the paper, you know, the, the, about the window of opportunity. But I think in hockey it, it rings more true for me because when you have the hard cap, yeah, you do bump up in, against uh, – uh, you do have situations where, yeah, you better do it this year because you're not going to have some of those guys next year. So go back, uh, go yeah. back to the 2010 Stanley Cup champions, right? And so what we, happened we, after yeah, that? We, we've been through this. Uh, so yeah, I think in in hockey, maybe more than the other sports, you have that window of opportunity that uh, is there, and you need to probably take advantage of it because then it is, in a very in a real sense, it's going to close on you. Uh, uh, you know, the next year. Yeah. So. it was a tough week. Uh, I, obviously, last week was a tough week for the Hawks with Kane. Uh, going down with an injury for 12 weeks. Yeah. Um, 
you, you know, he got shut out against Tampa Bay. Um, the whole sharp, the whole sharp rumors going on, and the uh, supposed fights in the locker room, which everybody seems to be denying. Yeah, that's that's what they're saying. I, I and you know what, I got, I have I have to believe if the if any of that was true, that Patrick Sharp would be wearing somebody else's uniform today. I would think so, too, because I don't think the Hawk, Hawks would operate and leave him like this. Yeah, I don't think so, either. I I, they're they're not going to, uh, you know, they they want to win, and if, if something is standing in the way of them winning, they're going to they're gonna change that. So yeah. if there was any truth to that, uh, I don't think Sharp would still be here. Yeah. And I, I have to say, what I read in the paper, what he said in the paper yesterday you know, I'm buying into what Sharp is saying as I, opposed I, to some rumors that are flying around. Yeah, I, I would kind of go that way, too. Mm-hmm. Mr. DeVito, you have a quizzical look on your face. No? No? You? no. I, I'm just interested in that, in this rumor that, because uh, I heard bits, bits and pieces on radio about it yesterday. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is what is the real, what, what is, what's it all about? I, I never got to the base of it. Uh, supposedly there was some discord in the locker room and, um, uh, there was a fight, fist fight in the locker room that involved Sharp and Sharp was having a thing with one of the other players' wives. That was the alleged story that was being bandied about. Mm-hmm. Nobody's been able to prove it. Nobody's been able to come up with anything. Yeah. And the Hawks are denying it, and uh, you know Sharp himself. And Sharp, uh, even, is, and Sharp even said, "I'll take legal action against I, anybody." Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. that's yeah. That so. I heard, I heard that also. That's why I was inquisitive. What what was going on? Yeah, he was he was really serious about it. And you know what? Uh, from his point of view, I could see it because, you know, his comment was, you know, I have two young, uh, da- uh, I don't know, kids. Let's say, I don't know if they're daughters or. Uh, you know, obviously a wife, and they have to listen to this stuff. And you know what? I I'm mad, and I may take some le- legal action. Which I don't know if he can as a public figure. I'm not really sure what if he's got that option. But uh, you know, I am when he, when I read what he had to say. You know, I buy what he's saying. I so. I, I kind of go I I go along with you on that because you know I I began to think back and I. Th- began to think back to the whole uh, uh, Ryan Sandberg, Dave Martinez issue, however many years ago, 25 years ago with that. And, mm-hmm. think, you know, now it's funny that uh, here's Dave Martinez, uh, the bench coach on the Cubs. Yeah. Well, that things things have a tendency to yeah. come full circle. Yeah. Uh, you know, Jim, the other uh, – we, we were talking about the Hawks, but the other big news is uh, the Bulls have lost two – major parts of their team yeah. for period, uh, fairly long periods of time here. And uh, we were talking a little bit yesterday about, there, put it this way, there's no doubt that they're going to have to add somebody uh, that's not with them currently. And who that somebody is going to be, we talked a little bit about. And you had said... Uh, I think Nate Nate's available. Nate, yeah, Robinson's uh, Nate Robinson Robinson was a name that you had mentioned, and of course Ronnie Brewer and Mike James you had said are favorites uh, of uh, Thibodeau. But I would think that at this point, when you lose two guys who are major uh, scorers, that I don't think Ronnie Brewer and Mike James are going to be the answer. I don't care if they're no. Thibodeau's adopted sons. No, uh, you're not. Gonna, you're you're gonna not going to get 20... somebody who's going to get some offense yeah. going for you. You're not going to get twenty points a game out of them. No. Um, you know, and uh, I don't know, you know, the old thing, when they, you know, when it rains, it pours. Boy, I'll tell you, the, the Bulls have, uh, I, 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 now how many games do they have left? Did you say they have 14 regular season games left? Or Something I left. thought that's what you had said yesterday. I didn't know where you uh, uh, had gotten that. Let's see, that. they are hmm. 37 and 23. That's... Uh, so that's 60, 60 games. So they got 22 games. 22 They've got games. 22 games left. I'm just wondering, my, my uh, thing is how far are they going to fall? Because I don't think they'll uh, put it this way. That's I don't I, care they, how good they are. The rest of the guys can play as as well as they could possibly play. You're still missing two major guys, and that's not that, that easy to replace. So who's going to – I mean, Pau Gasol, as good as he is, is – 
He's no defensive player. Well, well, I'm I'm thinking offense. No, I mean, offensively, he's not going to yeah. be able to take a, a huge load every night offensively. I mean, he'll do his thing. Uh, you know, Miritich is, uh, I don't know, he's still sort of a question mark. So you're going to have to patch this thing together somehow. And, and it's interesting here too because um, um, it's it's interesting that without Butler this year they're four and one. They're eight and three without Gibson since he's out with an ankle injury right now, mm-hmm. and they're eight and six without Rose. Now that obviously gives you an idea that the team is pretty deep. But you know when you're facing all three of them out at once. Yeah, I mean collect. Yeah, that, I, you could throw all yeah, of those you know, numbers out the window. You talk about those all numbers, three at those, once. Those numbers don't mean anything. What is it yeah. when they're all when all three of them are gone? Now, Jim, I, you know what? Before I, I, there's something that I was thinking about this morning before I came over that you had t- uh, mentioned to me last night that somebody had. Uh, I don't know if it was somebody that called in on one of the other radio stations. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I started to think about this uh, this morning, and I'm like, and uh, you know, when you you ran it by me last Tony night, Tony S- or Snell and and Butler and Butler are, are the Sultan poor Saint? man's. Yeah, okay. are the poor man's Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen. And you know, and I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, Jimmy Butler is a very good player, and I'm sure he's an excellent defender. Yeah. So okay, I'll, I'll give whoever made that comment the pass on Jimmy Butler, but here's uh, you know you have a coach like Thibodeau, who you you really don't start to see a playing time until you you have the defense down, and uh, Tony Snell as of late uh, offensively has has done much better job. He's started to score a little bit, but. I'm thinking to myself, how can you even make that comment? Because Tony Snell, up until now, maybe with the last month, let's say, has not gotten Thibodeau's confidence to the point where he was even playing that much. Now he's playing more, so he's probably to the point where he's getting it. But I'm thinking, how could this person even make that comment when Snell has just started maybe to play on a fairly regular basis how you even how you even make you, that comparison you can't even make that comment and what was even funnier and i didn't mention you after that he makes this comment that you've got the poor man's michael jordan and scotty pippen out on the floor now which just blew you know which just blew Bors and bernstein off the wall uh, yeah you could imagine off the wall you know telling him to you know stop watching basketball you need to report <laughs> to the basketball re-education camp immediately <laughs> he goes from that comment to saying so who do you think is going to run the offense in the 2016 season yeah the hill reaction was about the same <laughs> Yeah, the the Bulls offense. Yeah, that's what his that what's what his next question was, and who's going to run the offense in 2016? Oh wow! Yeah. <laughs> okay. And that was when they suggested uh, you you need to watch another sport. Yeah, that's for sure. Because obviously you don't understand the game of basketball. Wow, that's 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 interesting. Now see that there's the you know what those maybe ju- that's why we don't take callers on this show. Yeah, oh, I, you know what, though? I, I wouldn't mind taking those kind of callers. <laughs> that would be John, fun. John would, John, John, would not have, John. He, John would not only have the priest on, he wouldn't have the priest on speed dial. He'd have the priest here. Yeah, <laughs> the priest would be here. That's right. No, we'd, be, that, we'd be giving credit not only to John for handling the dials, but we'd have our spiritual advisor <laughs> presence in the, in the broadcast center as we do this show. Well, so I, uh, Jim, are both of our votes for uh, bringing Nate Robinson back? Uh, I think Mr. I, he's Mr. Instant I th- Offense. I think he would be. I think he would be fun coming off the bench. Besides, I mean, every, let's face it: when he left here, this town, he left on a high. People loved him. Oh yeah. I mean, he actually that uh, was that the year that they uh, they beat the was it the Nets in the first round that they took? Uh, I think so. Yeah. And I, what is I, that? I, two seasons ago. Two seasons ago. Yeah. And, and Nate Robinson was a huge part of that. Oh yeah. So and I put it this way: if it wasn't for the fact that you had uh, you know Derrick Rose was going to be coming back, uh, you know Nate Robinson might still be here. I mean, because I, I, I think that he was liked by everybody, mm-hmm. including, I think, the coaching staff, management, the players. and uh, But I, it was just a numbers game uh, in that case. And, uh, you know, he went where 
he went where he could make a little bit more money. He went where he could find a he he could find a role. Let's, yeah. Let's let's break the station and let uh, t- uh, John put it back together. Yeah. You are listening to Armchair Experts from the John DeVita Broadcast Center on Jack FM 89.7, WRHS FM Nords, and the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network on Wednesday, March the 4th, the year of our Lord, 2015, with Jim Leon and Rich Massaro. And you are tuned to WRHS FM 89.7, Norwich, Illinois. And now... Here they are, back once again, Jim and Rich. Thanks, John. Back on the the small but mighty eighty nine. This yes, indeedy, you better believe it. What are you What are you looking there at? I the, I, I had to. I, I was trying to remember uh, something. I uh, just going back to the trades. Um, I I had a kick out of. I got a kick out of it, and it was uh, the article was in. Actually, I found it on Deadspin. Uh, Jordan Leopold was traded uh, uh he's a defenseman he was traded from uh, uh columbus to minnesota mm-hmm. jordan leopold is from minnesota he's went to college at university of minnesota okay he's played everywhere but minnesota mm-hmm. his daughter wrote a letter to the minnesota wild yeah and it was really kind of a sweet letter that mm-hmm. you know i miss my dad my mom, my mom misses him. It's been tough on all of us. He said, "Coaches, you know what? You're losing because you need another defenseman." <laughs> yeah. So cute. could could you please? Maybe you should get my dad. Very cute. Yeah, I, I thought it was that. good, yeah. and they made the trade for him. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. Yeah. So. Very very nice. Nice story. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. I, it was a sweet letter, and they had it all. Uh, you know, the letter was uh, uh, in the articles and, uh, you know, very child, childlike scrawl. Yeah. And, yeah. and it, was, it was good. It was, everybody had a good laugh out of it. You know, Jim, as you're, as you're mentioning that, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, uh, people, I, you know when I first started uh, working for Kevin and uh, the first time I actually had to do a show uh, alone, you know, I, I was thinking to myself, geez, how am I going to do this? And uh, Kevin used to say, geez, you know, your your show. And when I did it with, uh, when I did the show initially with uh, Jim, uh, oh, God, Jim Andrews. And now that we, you know, we're doing the show together. Uh, you know, Kevin always would say, you know, we never, I really don't have to do anything with your guy's show. Because you guys just get up there and you do it, you wing it, and there's no... You know, there's no lulls in the uh, in in the commentary. You occasionally go off on a tangent, and then we have to you know re- re-record over something. Uh, but I, I'm <laughs> thinking to myself, people. I don't know know if people really know. It's just things pop into our minds, and that's how we come up with the subjects. But I, what I was going to say, Jim, as you were talking about Jordan Leopold, uh, I'm thinking back to one of the shows we did. I think it was during the summer, and we got on the subject of the Baseball Hall of Fame. And some of the guys who uh, had been passed over in the last election, and one of them, I'm pretty sure that you had mentioned was Minnie Minoso. I was just about when you said Hall of Fame and that, I was just about to say, let's talk about Minnie. And uh, I looked, you, you know, uh, I think at the time we talked about this, and uh, you you would name some of the guys that have been passed over by uh, what do they call the committee now? It's that the veterans committee. Well, they I think it's they have the veterans the, committee, but now yeah. they have the golden the golden the age, golden or, age or committee, or whatever it is. And they only do they only make selections once every three years. The golden age guys, yeah. But uh, Minnie Minoso was one of the guys on the list, and Minnie didn't. I don't think he missed uh, induction by much. It wasn't that many votes that he missed by. I don't think. Mm-hmm. And I'm, but I'm not sure how many guys are on that committee. So maybe it was. Maybe it didn't seem like much. Maybe it was more than what it seemed. But uh, when I read Minnie's uh, some of the articles about Minnie after he died, uh, you know, here's a guy who was not only a pioneer. You know, he was the first uh, black player for the White Sox. First Cuban player. First Cuban in player. In the majors. And uh, I don't know about that. I, I, I keep hearing it, that, but I'm not sure about that. I think that, he Jim. was. Uh, well, I mean, you know, he came up with the Indians. Okay. 
Uh, that part I'm not sure about because I thought there had been Cuban players in the majors going pretty far back, but black, uh, black Cuban. That, that first uh, black Cuban. Now uh, that that may be that that might have been the issue. Uh, but at any rate, uh, you know, in his first ten years, I think they said he had he had batted over three hundred eight or nine out of the first ten years he was in the uh, in the league. The other thing is uh, when you look at his overall record. I think he had 180 some homers. He had over a thousand RBIs. I'm, I'm sure he had uh, good numbers stolen bases because he was a uh, he was noted. I believe for that. he led the. Uh, uh, I believe he led the league in stolen bases. His first three years in the majors, right? But I, I think what I would he say led- on this is, if people think that he's short on the numbers. You know the the actual numbers, I, I, and I don't know how he stacks up against other people. I I, I believe though that Minnie Minoso, because of his situation, you know, being a pioneer, probably came into the league when he was already fairly old. He was twenty seven. Twenty seven, which probably meant he was thirty. That's possible <laughs> too. And so I think uh, you know you're. You have to look at his numbers if that's what you're looking at in light of the fact of when he actually first came on the major league scene mm-hmm. and and then digest them in that way. Now, I, I would say this. I don't know what Jackie Robinson's numbers are, for instance, but I, I would say, you know, you look at Jackie Robinson's numbers, I, I think Jackie Robinson played either 10 years or just shy of it, so his numbers couldn't have been, uh, you know, they weren't a ton, but Jackie Robinson is in not only because he was a, a very, very great ball player, but he was a pioneer. Mm-hmm. And I think, a guy, say, a guy like Minnie Minoso should be viewed in the same way. He was. He really was. And I don't think he's getting that, I don't think he's getting that uh, benefit of the doubt, though. I mean, because he's not in, and when he gets in, he, he'll already be dead. So yeah, what, he rece- yeah, he received nine of the 12 votes needed when the Golden Era Committee, which replaced the Veterans Committee to elect candidates, um, met first met in 2011. Mm-hmm. Um, a seven-time All-Star, three-time Golden Glove winner. Uh, Minoso batted 298 with a 389 on on-base percentage, 186 homers, 1,023 RBIs. 205 stolen bases. Over a 10-year period beginning in 1951, he finished in the American League top 10 in batting average eight times, in steals nine times, and in RBIs five times. Oh, so, okay. You know, the, Jim, did we talk about this? Was I talking uh, about this with you the other day, or uh, was it Jimmy Sunshine? But I said, you know, uh, when you think about, say, a guy like Minoso and, and falling short of the Hall of Fame, uh when you the Hall of Fame voters, do you? I know that, uh, and this is an old name that probably anybody who's listening uh, probably have not, you probably haven't heard of this guy, and I'm sure uh, my partner knows who he is. But the guy that always uh, was uh, sort of a bone of contention with people was a guy by the name of Addie Joss. Yeah. Who was a pitcher yeah. probably prior to the twenties pre, pre no 20s. Pri- I think he might have gone he might have gone back he might have actually gone back to he might have been in the late eighteen hundreds no early nineteen no, hundreds not, not, no I don't think okay. so Jim but I All but right, the the, the bone of contention with Addie Joss was that he uh, pitched ten years and then died at an early age while he was still an active player and. Uh, his his uh, statistics were good for the ten years. He was an outstanding one of the top pitchers, and I think he is in the Hall of Fame. I think they finally did put him in, but it was always a bone of contention: was ten years enough time? And uh, it made me think a little bit. Uh, and I think maybe it was uh, Jim uh, Matthews that I was talking to about this. Recently, I was reading something, and they were talking about the great, uh, the two great championship eras of the Philadelphia A's when Connie Mack was in charge. And the first era, of course, had some familiar names like uh, Al Simmons and Jimmy Fox and uh, Lefty Grove. Yep. But the second era had other, fam- you know, other names that were familiar. But one of the names that, that was there was a guy by the name of Indian Bob Johnson. Mm-hmm. 
And I said, geez, I, you know what, I guess I've heard of him, but I, you know, it's sort of vague. So I looked up Indian Bob Johnson's numbers, and I'm just going by memory. I only looked at him once, but there was a five, let's say a five to seven year period where Bob Johnson had excellent, you know, home run, RBI, batting average numbers. And then for whatever reason, you know, that fell off. And I guess my question is, what is the period of time that you have to play? Is there a period of time that you have to play to be acknowledged by the Hall of Fame electors? You know, the other uh, thing... It's uh, a good, uh, that's a good question. I think, you have, I think what it really comes down to is you have to consider more the body of work that they have. Now, I, I looked up Addie Joss, and you, you are correct. It was after the, in the early 1900s. Mm-hmm. He played from 1902 to 1910 with the Cleveland Indians. Right. During his career, he won 160 games and lost 97. Mm-hmm. His earned run average during that, uh, during that time was 1.89. Okay. 1.89? Uh, 1.89. Okay. Um, he, of course, it was a much different game there during sure. that time. He he appeared in 286 games. He started 260 of them and completed 234 out of those 260 starts. Okay. Well, let, let me um, ask Jim. And his, his, biggest, his biggest season... Well, he had two two really great seasons. In 1907, he led the league in victories. He was 27 and 11 with a 1.83 ERA. In 1908, he was 24 and 11 with a 1.16 ERA. Okay. 19, 1909, he was 14 and 13. In 1910, he was five and five. Okay, so something something was happening to him right at the end of his career. That mm-hmm. it looks like. Uh, yeah, here's here's what I was gonna now because I'm I'm uh, and he died in April fourteenth, nineteen eleven. Okay. Yeah, you know what? I'm not uh, totally throwing Minnie Minoso to the curb, but I'm on a Hall of Fame discussion now, Jim. I was gonna ask you: Do you know when now? Because this uh, when I was talking with Jim Matthews, this also came up. When did they actually start the Baseball Hall of Fame? Nineteen thirty-six was the first class. But the Hall of Fame didn't open until three years later. Okay. 1936 was the first uh, yeah. first election. And the first class, actually, not, are you sure that was 1936? 1936. So they didn't have any waiting period at that point. Because if it was 1936, Babe Ruth would have still been an active player. and he was Ruth one, retired in 35. Okay, so he was just done being an active right. player. Right. So with the, the first class was uh, Babe Ruth, Ty Cobb. Walter, Walter Johnson, Johnson, Grover uh, Cleveland, and Cy Young, Alexander right? and Cy Young, I believe. Yeah, was we yeah. said Walter Johnson, right? Yes. Yeah. So it was five, and it, those were, I think those were the five. But it it also led me to another uh, point, and it goes back to and uh, you know I, I probably zero people care about Indian Bob Johnson, but I, I one of the things I had said to Jim Matthews was, okay, you're starting the Hall of Fame, whatever year it is. You've got five, you know, obviously shoe-in candidates that you put in first. But you're filling, you know, you're filling the the Hall of Fame. You have, as the years go on, you have a lot, a lot of strong candidates. Now, did a guy like Bob Johnson, who maybe should have had some consideration, just get lost in that initial shuffle because you had so many obvious, obvious candidates early on? Oh, yeah. You know, so that that this guy not even get a look because you know after you get done with Babe Ruth and and uh, that that whole first class, then you go on to guys like uh, actually we were wrong on the first class: Ty Cobb, Babe Ruth, Hannes Wagner, Christy oh, Ma- Hannes Wagner, Christy Matthews, Christy and Walter Johnson. I think uh, also Cy Young wasn't one. of them. Cy Young was not one of them. Okay. I thought he was okay. So I be but regardless of who it was. Then you, you start to fill in uh, the rest of the classes, and you you got guys like uh, Lou Gehrig, Hank Greenberg, uh, Al Simmons, Jimmy Fox, you know, Lefty Gomez, Lefty Grove, uh, J- uh, you know. So what I'm saying is there were probably worthy candidates 
who weren't thought of at all because you had so many really big, big names that you were filling in, you know, just to get the thing uh, off the ground. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying, Jim? Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting, too. We talk, you, you, you brought up the point about the waiting period. Mm -hmm. The five-year waiting period was established in 1954 after an evolutionary process. In 1936, all players were eligible, including active ones. Okay. From, 1930, from the 1937 election until 1945, there was no waiting period, so any retired player was eligible, but writers were discouraged from voting from current major leaguers. Since there was no formal rule preventing a writer from casting a ballot for active players, the scribes did not always comply with the informal guideline. Mm -hmm. Joe DiMaggio received a vote in 1945, for example. From, 19, from the 1946 election until the 1954 election, an official one-year uh, waiting period was in effect. DiMaggio, for example, retired after the 1951 season and was first eligible in the 1953 election. Hmm. The modern rule establishing a wait of five years was passed in 1954, although an exception was made for Joe DiMaggio because of his high level of previous support, thus permitting him to be elected within four years of his retirement. Contrary to popular belief, no formal exception was made for Lou Gehrig other than to hold a special one-man election for him. Now, let me ask you, I, I think that five-year rule has been waived at least once, though. Didn't they waive it for Clemente? They waived it for Clemente, very similar to them, whatever they did with, uh, with, Gehrig? with Gehrig in in his in the informal way things were being done. Well, well actually, they didn't waive it. They just held a special election. You know what I never understood, though, Jim? What would, uh, and you know what? I, I can't think of a Hall of Fame, whether it's from high school to uh, the pros, that doesn't any different. But what would be wrong? Wouldn't it be a great selling point for your game to have a, uh, a Hall of Famer that was actually still playing? I mean, why I, I don't I don't never I don't think I ever got my mind totally around why there had to be a waiting period. I I, I never understood that either. But I mean, you had people go into the Hall of Fame who were still active in some capacity during the uh, d uh, in in baseball after they were elected. Frank Robinson, yeah, was one. Okay. Frank Robinson, sure. I think, was managing when he went into the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that happened. You know, I Nolan think that's Nolan Ryan was a baseball executive while he was there. Right. Right, I I just never I never understood it because when you uh, I mean this isn't the most obvious guy but he's the first name that bounced in my head. Uh, you, you had say a guy like Tom Seaver, who you know was finishing out his career with teams like the Sox and the Red, uh, White Sox and the Red Sox, you know, but he was obviously going to be in the Hall of Fame. So why couldn't he have been in the Hall of Fame? And you know it's not just Seaver. There's other guy, Greg Maddox. Uh, or any, there's a lot of guys that Randy that, Johnson. Yeah, right. You had guys that would be obvious. Wouldn't it have been great to see Tony Gwynn in the Hall of Fame mm -hmm. while he was playing? Yeah, Kirby Puckett. Right. I mean, those guys are obvious choices, and <clears throat> why couldn't they have been Hall of Famers while they were still playing? I don't. I never because, really understood that because they never listen to us. They don't listen to us. They don't listen to yeah. us. John does. John smiles. Mm -hmm. He goes. I don't listen to you guys either. So. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. But uh, you know what, Jim? Uh, I I noticed that we're we're not running super short, but we're getting close. The the one thing that we had talked about yesterday too, uh, that we uh, I sort of wanted to get to, is that uh, I, I have coffee with a bunch of guys at uh, Mariano's a couple night days a week and. Uh, Andy Ronstadt was saying the other day, March twelfth, that we're getting close to March twelfth, and uh, the Bears will either decide that they're going to have uh, Jay Cutler on the roster or not. I personally think it's a slam dunk that Cutler is going to be with the team. I think you're going to. I think you're going to have him one more year because you don't want to take a sixteen and a half million cap hit. Right. You know. Now it's interesting. the 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 NFL uh, Players Association announced Monday the salary cap. Will be one hundred and forty three point two eight million. Jeez, that's an awful lot of money. Uh, the Bears carry over a million five forty five and change in unused cap space last year from last season, giving them an adjusted cap of one hundred and forty five million one hundred and sixty eight thousand four hundred and thirty four dollars. 
Wow, they don't have any sense in there? No sense. Why, they, there is no sense okay. in football. No. There is no sense. No, not much. According to Spot, uh, spotrack.com, uh, a website that specializes in salary cap matters, the Bears are looking at approximately $25 million in cap space. Although new deals for tight end Zach Miller and Nickelback to Montre Hurst were not factored in, the $25 million figure takes into account uh, signing the 2015 draft class, approximately $6 million, and that only the top 51 players' salaries count against the cap in the offseason. According Wait, to what the, the heck? Uh, 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 yeah, you know, that's why we, we could figure out the hockey. Hockey's really easy. Uh, hockey, yeah. All right, this is all. your cap. That's it. Nope. nope. Some of this other stuff is hieroglyphics. You know, and um, and I still don't know, as far as baseball, what a Super 2 player is, and I that's my homework for the next time. Well, we didn't didn't we think that maybe somebody just made it up? Uh, well, the way Rosner, when I first time I heard that was listening to a show on the score, and Barry Rosner was on, and sometimes Rosner... Uh, he just shoots from the hip, I like think, Leo the Lip. I think, uh, you know... When he was trying to tell everyone that, you know, Josh McCown was going to be a Hall of Famer and he was going to make Johnny Manziel the greatest quarterback in the history of the Ma- National Football League just by his mere presence on the roster in Cleveland. Who is going to be the Hall of Famer? <laughs> Johnny Manziel. Oh, Johnny Manziel. Yeah, he's going to make him a top five. And J- Josh McCown, there's a guy who can do anything. Josh McCown can. Yeah. Okay, whatever. And there were people who actually bit. <laughs> no disrespect to Josh McCown, but yeah, yeah okay. There were people Fine. who actually bid on that, and I just texted, you know, Rosner, <laughs> who you crap? <laughs> I, you know, I, I tell you what, I I hate social media. I mean, because it just you know anything anything anybody says gets out there. And it is it is ridiculous, and and the and I and I was trying to find the article, and now I can't. Uh, I saw an article. This morning, when I was sitting and having uh, uh, having my breakfast this morning, and now talk on it, I cannot find it. But talk about the stupidity of people on social media. Mm-hmm. It's probably gone too far down. It's probably gone too far down on the list right now to find it. But essentially, what had happened was. Uh, Kurt Schilling's daughter got a scholarship to go to some college out east and for their softball team. Okay. So Schilling tweeted, you know, congratulations to his daughter, uh, you know, making this and how proud he was of her. Mm-hmm. So the morons on social media started making nasty comments about what they're going to, you know, how they're going to take care of his daughter. Oh, my gosh. So, you know, all this stuff. So Schilling... You know, screen printed all of that, and started to research the people that that were making these comments. Okay, he found one of them. Uh, one of them, I think, was a, the vice president of a uh, of a fraternity on okay. campus, and okay. he said, uh, uh, he and whatever college it was, he said, I've uh, re- researched the 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 standards of your fraternity and the college. Seems to me, I think you violated at least ninety of them. Wow! Uh, another guy had a uh, uh, he had a summer job lined up, and this was out east. He had a summer job lined up with the Yankees in the ticket office. Mm-hmm. The Yankees terminated him. Oh wow! Okay. With the comment that we have zero tolerance for things like this. Okay. So the stupidity of of people nowadays when they put stuff out on social media. It's going to come back and haunt you. Yeah, well, that's for Don't sure. Don't be a... All right, John, I'm going to say it. Don't be a dumbass. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. You know, eventually, somewhere along the way, somebody's going to find it, and you're... Yeah. You know. Yeah. Well... If you, you wouldn't say it to somebody's face, don't think you can hide behind social media and think you're going to be. it's going to be a big secret. Mm. No. Hey, that's for sure. Hey, I got one other thing. I got a I got a kind of a kick out of the other day when I saw this uh, saw this article. Minor league minor league baseball promos can always be kind of fun. I mean, I had one a number of years ago. I participated in with a buddy of mine uh, at a Beloit uh, at a Beloit Snappers game. 
they had a it was David Letterman night night and they were going to have a top ten fans list and the subject was top ten baseball promotions that didn't go well. Mm. And you could name things. We had things like oh, people had things like socks off our feet night. Things things we found these are actual things or you just made ma- up made them up. Okay. You know, th- uh, things things we found under the seat night. Mm-hmm. I, I had the number one thing. Mine was used steroid needle night. <laughs> used, okay. <laughs> but, okay. Uh, here, here are some promotions. As the schedules for 2015 start rolling out, it's clear the quest to grab attention can cross into the surreal. Mm-hmm. Here's a half a dozen things. I'm going to read the description. See if you can tell me what's real, what's not. Back to the Future Night. To celebrate the movie's 30th anniversary, the team will wear jerseys made to look like Marty McFly's vest and jeans jacket ensemble, while the fans enjoy 80s-themed decor, contest, and music. A DeLorean will be on display, and anyone born in 1955 or 1985, the years in which the movie is set, will get in free. Real or fake? Real. Real. It's real. It's actually going to be done by the Gary Railcats. Okay. Mad Men Night. As the AMC show kicks off its final season, the team will wear throwback jerseys and give discounts to men who show up in suits and slick back hair and women in dresses and white gloves. Vendors will hawk candy cigarettes, drinks will be served in plastic tumblers, and there will be an ad slogan contest. Real or fake? Fake. Fake. Brian Williams' Pants on Fire Night. To roast the fallen NBC anchor during the game, a fan named Brian Williams will read tall tales. A pair of pants will be burned, and between inning contests will include to tell the truth and two truths and a lie. Anyone in attendance named Brian Williams will have a chance to throw out the ceremonial first pitch. Fake. Real. No, it's real. The the Akron rubber ducks. (laughs) Okay. Deflate gate night. In homage to the Patriots, the first 1,200 fans will receive inflatable baseballs, with 11, with 11 of every 12 getting one that's deflated. There will be discounts on meatball sandwiches and roasted nuts, and there will be deflated hot air balloon rides at the park. Music will include great balls of fire and wrecking ball. Real or fake? Fake. Real. <laughs> Real. We'll the Myrtle fire. Beach Pelicans are going to do that. Mm. Alice in Wonderland night. For the Kitty Lit Classics 150th anniversary, the team will give a cartoon version of the book to anyone not arriving late. Host a tea party during the seventh inning stretch and invite winners of a Mad Hat contest to play croquet on the field with the Queen of Hearts and the Cheshire Cat. Fake. Fake. And the final one, Saved by the Bell Night. The team will honor the 80s Saturday morning cult classic with themed jerseys, a pregame sprain dance, an oldest cell phone contest, and a screech chess tournament. Anyone named Johnny Dakota will be banned from the ballpark, and fans with perms or stonewashed jeans can run the bases after the game. Fake. Real. The Brooklyn Cyclones. Oh, (laughs) jeez. You know, I, every time I think about a promotion, Jim, I think about uh, what, what Bill Vex said. He said, you know what? You, you, you give away 4,000 Eskimo pies. You know, you have 4,000 4, 4, Eskimo, Eskimo pies to 4,000 people. That's a promotion. But he says, you know what? You give away 4,000 Eskimo pies to one person. Now that, there's a, now there's an interesting proposition. So uh, I, always, I always thought his reaction the next day after Disco Demolition Night was classic. His comment was, the promotion went too well. <laughs> went too well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it went too well. Oh God! Uh, um, it's uh, what else should we talk about? Or does John want us to get out? John get out. Yeah, John goes, yeah, 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 whatever. You got uh, there. There was something. Uh, why uh, something that is not coming forward to the front of my head here? I was thinking about more about the promotions. Uh, but it's uh, you know what? It's good to see that those minor league teams are. Are thinking about how to bring more people in and uh, watch baseball. <clears throat> I was going to ask you this, Jim, real quick. One of the things that I uh, think is absolutely wrong is the uh, new speed up rules for baseball, which I think are going to be discarded quickly. I'm I'm wondering how long it's going to take before they stop enforcing them. 
I, I'd say this, though. I, I, what bothers me about things like that is the same thing that bothers me when they say, okay, pro football games are going too long. Uh, the game or anything that's happening in the game, uh, in pro football's case, I'll say this, uh, has nothing to do, uh, the game itself has nothing to do with why broadcasts are going so long. Uh, obviously, the commercials are doing it. Baseball's a little bit different. I think they they have their own problem, but I don't think it's the fact that uh, you know a certain batter steps out on every pitch or that the pitcher is not delivering the ball quick enough. You know, there's there's guys who obviously take their time, and that can be frustrating depending on who you are as a fan. But what's really obviously uh, lengthening the games out is the game is played in a totally different way in terms of the pitching. Uh, as, as opposed to what it was yeah. 20, 30, 40 years ago because there are so many pitching changes. That's what's lengthening the you, game, you, and yeah. that's that, you know, that's not going to change. You realize, uh, what was it? Did I hear that the Sox might be planning to come north with eight relievers? Yeah, I think they, I think they talked eight, about that. Eight relievers, which means you're going to have three bench players. Thank God you got somebody like Emilio, if Emilio makes the White Sox team, because he can play, what, six positions? They were talking about how Beckham could Beckham might be a key in that role as a utility player because you can put him at third, short, or second. Right. Uh, it, you know. Yeah, right. No, but the, I, I, but the, 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 game is, the game is so totally different the way it's done now. Yeah, it is. And uh, that's it has nothing to do with, uh, you know, if you bring in a reliever and he throws – 10 pitches and they're, they're going to let him now only throw four. I mean, yeah, I mean, will that well, speed it up I okay, always, a little bit? I, but... I, I never, I, I guess as long as I've, you know, in the however many years, almost 60 years I've been a baseball fan, I never understood why if a guy's been warming up in the bullpen, he needs to come to the mound and throw eight more pitches. Yeah, I mean, I think the, you know there's some there's some logic to that. Although get the feel of the mound and you know manicure it the way he wants it. Yeah, you, it you can you can do yeah. that. You don't need eight pitches to do that. No, but they, I I, st- I still think they're uh, you know they're looking in the wrong places if they wanted to speed the game up at all. Uh, it's uh, you know the things that they're suggesting to speed it up are not going to really do the trick. Yeah. Hey, we want to remind you, uh, since we're going to be on on Wednesday, we've got a game on Wednesday night. Uh, Northtown, uh, let's see, Vernon Hills will play Northtown at 6 o'clock. That game will be on the Internet. No radio. It'll be streaming video on the Internet. And we'll come on at 7.30 with the Rebels versus the, Ante- versus the Antioch Sequoites. Is that what the Antioch? I didn't know that. S-E-Q-U-O-I-T-S. Okay, Sequoits. yeah. The Sequoits. I didn't know that was their nickname. Yeah. Uh, last night, first round uh, first round of the regionals at Ridgewood. On Monday night, rather, first round of the regionals at uh, Ridgewood. Northtown defeated Sen 63-48. to They move on to take on the number one seed, Vernon Hills. And we will be on at around, right around 730 with Antioch. I'm in the office until 7. Hopefully I don't have a client. If not, you're in charge. Oh, yeah. You're in charge. No problem. Try not to. Try not to. I'm giving you the keys. Okay. John, keep him under control, please. John, you know. You know, keep him, under, keep him under control until I get there. Yeah. You know, I, I, you know. I'm going to have to find out what a sequoid is before the game. I think that's your, that's your homework. I've I've already notified the Divine Savior to okay. be on standby. All right. <laughs> Maybe you can get the priest to come there. Yeah, yeah. Maybe just have. The maybe break. he can do the color while I'm waiting for Jim. <laughs> if I, if for some reason I'm delayed, you know, I might be running in the door. We'll see. Hopefully, it uh, it's you know it's been a little quiet still. So maybe I'll be able to get over there and be there just before just before tip off. I think it's time for us to move out of here. Yeah, I think we've John, run out of stuff. For everything, buddy. John, thanks for everything as always. Thanks for the coffee. Thanks for spinning the dials. Thanks for putting up with our nonsense. Thanks for the memories. Thanks for the memories. We'll be back in a couple of weeks to for more of our general all-around nonsense. Thanks for listening. We are out of here. We are taillights.
You have been listening to Armchair Experts from the John DeVita Broadcast Center on Wednesday, March the 4th, the year of our Lord, 2015, on Jack FM 89.7 WRHS FM Norwich and the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network with the WRHS FM sports announcers Jim Leon and Rich Massaro. This broadcast was directed by John DeVita and radio station manager is Kevin Zeffick for WRHS FM Norwich and the executive producer of Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network is Mr. John Shikanda. This broadcast was pre-recorded on Tuesday, March the 3rd, the year of our Lord, 2015. Until next time, please be safe and thanks for listening. And this is Jack FM 89.7 WRHS FM Norwich, Illinois.